everyone, and welcome to this spoiler review for episode three of Shogun, this incredible brand new series that is on FX and Hulu. I am the outlaw, John Roca, joined by my Hatamoto, uh, Steve <laughs> Morris. Steve, how are you, brother? My co-host of the Cinephiles here, and uh, people enjoyed our breakdowns of one and two, brother, so you are back again for episode three. How are you feeling? How are you doing? I'm good. I am proud to be a Hatamoto in the Outlaw Nation. And I don't think it was funny. I was just thinking, I don't think I've ever said to you, yes, I love the that that Outlaw Nation music. I think oh, it is so you. perfect for you and your show. I think I'd love it. It's great. Thank you so much. If I, if only I could get a much more complicated video to go along with the music, I think I'd be super happy with the presentation. But you take what you can get in Canva and uh, you know your limited skills that I have to put you, this stuff together. But it's very you know, the, 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 the Shogun title sequence is beautiful. You could just hire those people. I'm sure they could put together <laughs> something fantastic for you. Yeah. I've got a few hundred thousand lying around somewhere, for God's sakes. I should be able <laughs> yeah. to do it. Um, and Steve mentions it's Shogun. That's what we're here to talk about. Episode 3. Tomorrow is tomorrow. Although I kind of think steve the title should be uh you know you're, you're playing a game of friends and enemies when it's really all about you and so I, <laughs> that was the predominant theme throughout this particular episode here that was a really fascinating episode there was a mixture of political intrigue political machinations moving pieces around a chessboard combined with some thrilling action sequences fight scenes moments of honor uh and fun moments where Someone is simulating sexual innuendo stuff on a stick of a boat and uh, sliding through there <laughs> and escaping. So, so much to talk about in this particular episode. Steve, your thoughts overall here as we came out of the first two episodes, which were just incredible, sliding through this third episode. Did you feel any loss of rhythm, any loss of pace, or did it just get you even more excited to dive into the story uh, that we're being presented is being presented to us in this interpretation? Not for me. There was no, I, I think not, I think they nailed it. And in particular, you know, this is, it's the fascinating difference between novels and film mm. is that there are things they were able to do in the film that were short and tight and to the point that took pages and pages in the book to set up in a much more subtle way. So I really yeah. liked it. And can I tell you please how insane your uh, partner is? Your hot <laughs> please tell me. Oh, well, yes. after we, I had so much time fun in our conversation that after our we we did it and I went okay I'm ready for the third part I went I'm just gonna read the book again. <laughs> And so, yeah, for, those, for those of you who might have missed episodes one and two, Steve is a very big fan of James Clavell and these this particular book and a number of his books, and he's done a lot of research on James Clavell. So him diving back into the book uh, is no surprise to me. Uh, how did that go? I, I mean, it's the advantage, as you know, is I listen to books at like a really high speed, and so mm. I can get through a lot of pages. It was really fun, and it's so funny. My my as James Clavell was my favorite author as a teenager and in my early 20s. Yeah. And then as I started to learn more and I sort of saw the the exotic the exotification of Asia and yeah. some of the sexual things and some of the gender things. And I was like, and, and in my 30s and 40s, I kind of went, I still really like the books, but this is very much a white guy, you know, yeah, his fantasy about right. what this should be. Right. And what's funny listening to the book now and watching the show now is I'm like, look, all that is true. Mm -hmm. It's still true, but I think the books are still great and they're still doing a great yeah. thing. Yes, they're from a certain era, sure. but but they're still doing a great thing. And I think that the show is really highlighting what's some of the stuff that's really cool about the approach. Well, I think it's fascinating too, Steve, because if you look at the greatest of the Akira Kurosawa films, and certainly we've covered a few on the cinephiles, sure. it's always a mixture of the Western influence combined with the Eastern influence. So it can get a bit muddled. It can get a bit, a bit mixed in your mind. And so delineating or separating out what is the Western romanticism of Japanese culture and samurai culture versus what is the actual in, uh, feeling in Japan towards the Japanese culture mm -hmm. of that time feud during feudal Japan and the samurai approach to things are two different things. And so you, you kind of have to walk that line respectfully to understand your own interpretation of it. But certainly this show has focused more on the Japanese storylines, which we mentioned in our review on episodes in episodes one and two, much more than the John Blackthorne storyline, the white man storyline that we got like in the 1980s series with right. Richard Chamberlain. So that's been fun to see. And uh, we should dive into this episode here because I thoroughly enjoyed it and really loved loved it. And so I want to talk about it with you. And I want to take it into section in, in sections, to be honest sure. with you. Normally I do the storylines, but I think this is a show, this episode lent itself to discussing sections here. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. 
When we start off, we have Toronaga talking to Yabushige. He's a Yabushige thinks he's going to die. I love this his fascination with death, where he's written multiple wills, and this is really the best one he's ever done, which is hilarious. <laughs> but he stands his own, as we said in episodes one and two. Yabushige is such a fantastic and interesting character. He is. Walks in knowing he's going to pro- die, thinking he's going to die. He puts up no fight, no defense, no nothing. Walks in and uh, Toronaga. Um, it quizzes him, essentially interrogates him about Ishido and what Ishido promised him. And Yabushige very uh, honestly says, yeah, he offered me a seat in the council. I didn't want that. I just wanted to engross my, uh, uh, increase my fiefdom and do my thing. And he thinks he's going to have, he, you know, he makes a comment, I can't do that without my head. And Toronaga says, no, you're going to keep your head, but this is what I need you to do. I need you to bring the foreigner. I need you to bring Lady Marika. I need you to bring all these people to this fishing village uh, and uh, get in your in your fiefdom and guarantee their safety here. So he essentially employs what he knows to be a double agent, but he employs him by relying on his honor, relying on his um, his devotion to him. And this leads us to this sequence outside where they're all lining up to go out the gate. And we have um, uh, Toronaga essentially pull one of his tricks here to be instead of uh, be in this uh, carrying uh, uh, contraption instead of Lady Kiri. So this is a fascinating sequence that leads to these these uh, confrontations here. Blackthorn stops uh, one of Ishido's people from looking in there to cover what Toronaga is doing because they him and Mariko know what, what's going on here. And then we end up leading out the door. So what do you think of this opening here, this game of... Um, I, I, I want to say this is game of like, um, I don't know, just intelligence that Toronaga is playing here and understanding he can use people in certain ways and play on their natural instincts or desires because he's somewhat elevated his intelligence at, at uh, confronting this kind of stuff. Well, this is why I'd never thought of the comparison with Game of Thrones until I saw people mentioning it when the show started. Mm. But now it's like, no, absolutely. Not only that, I'm sure George R.R. Martin read Shogun and Noble mm-hmm. House and Taipan, which is all these books where all the huge casts and all right. these machinations right. of everybody trying to get ahead. This is also why you remember in the first part, I told you that Yabushige is one of my favorite characters, despite yeah. the fact that he's a horrible person. Kind like of he's. He's, but he's just a joy, and their version of it is so good. Yeah. And that scene, I think they do, because because I'll disagree with one thing you said. You said okay. that he was sort of Tornaga's depending on his honor. Yeah, I don't think I I don't think he trusts Yabushige's honor at all. Oh, Yabushige, okay. he's he 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 Toranaga knows that yeah. Yabushige could easily betray him to Ashido at any point. Right. He's depending upon his self interest. He is depending oh, upon his point. ability good to point. manipulate him. Right, and this is that. That's why this scene is so good. His loyalty Yabushige. to himself. Loyalty to himself is what I mean. Yeah, exactly. Yabushige knows he's going to die, and it's like, okay, I'm cool with this. That's yeah. way. If I got to die, I got to die. And Toranaga knows that he knows that, and is manipulating him and messing with him. And one thing I'll add, just because I am rereading the book, is that yeah. this place that he took him to in the book is a place where the Taiko took Toranaga before. And when they made their big deal, and they're like at a high floor looking out of the window, is yeah. they pissed, they pissed on the deal. So they both pissed out of this window on this high floor. And at the end of the scene in the book, Toranaga says, let's piss on it. And they piss on the deal. Wow. Yabushige, which which I was kind of sad they didn't do because I just sort of <laughs> love that bit. But I, I think the scene is handled perfectly. And I'm I'm loving Toranaga. I think, yeah. you know, Toshiro to Mufuni aside, I think this guy, he's killing it. And then mm-hmm. the, the only difference I'll say, by the way, of the escape, which I also I love that you're getting this. Toronaga is the trickster. Toronaga yes. is the genius who's always yeah. he's always steps ahead of everybody. One of the differences in the book is that Blackthorn sees that Toronaga has switched places with this uh, woman, and yeah. he doesn't talk to Mariko about it. So he thinks he's the only one who knows oh. in the book. Um, but other than that, it, it's just you know they're sort of slightly different choices. But but that I think that sequence of getting out of the castle and the tension around it, and yeah. this is also where you start to see. Oh, Blackthorn is a valuable person. Like this right. is a smart guy. And I think they've made him lesser than, I think, in the first two episodes mm-hmm. compared to the book and definitely compared to the 1980 Richard Chamberlain. But ne- what that's allowing them to do is that he's now emerging as someone who yeah. is, could it could be a really useful person for Tornado. Yeah, it's a great point you bring up, Steve, certainly because the, we're seeing him in, become more and more of the focus 
with Toranaga by the end of this episode, right? Where he's teaching him diving and whatever. But we he had to immerse. He had to kind of pull this ruse with this guy who was looking into the women's women's uh, quarters there and as they were being carried there. He was look he stopped him from essentially by causing all this fuss and doing whatever. And and you might say, look, what uh, what uh, Yabushige is doing is definitely for loyalty to himself, but so is a little bit Blackthorn because right, Mariko says what when he asks what happens if they catch us, uh, she says they'll kill us all. And of so course, yeah. in a way, he's also yes, you might think you might be fooled into thinking he's doing the right thing by uh, by helping Toranaga, but he's also doing the right thing because if they do find it, he'll be dead. And so yeah. it's also self-preservation in a way, kind of like Yabushige, which is why I look forward to those two going at it again at some point down the road in this show. Um, and I think you make an excellent point about the fact that he can now emerge because this is a 10-episode series. So right. There's no rush to make him the focus just yet. Let him grow as his as the um as Toronaga and Mariko and other people's esteem for him grows, ours will grow as well as we watch him uh, take the lead in certain ways while he maintains himself as a, a pretty rude customer in a lot yeah. of ways. So, oh, uh, yeah, but what, what did you think about this uh, uh, line here as a hostage? Uh, uh, Mariko was talking about this when Toronaga was uh, essentially traded by his father when he was six years old, uh, yeah, to uh, his family's rivals. Mariko says this, as a hostage, he learned one truth, that enemies are everywhere and friends nowhere. So little hint of uh, a window into understanding Toronaga from Lady Mariko here. What did you think of that? I think it's a great line, and I think it explains perfectly the Yabushige relationship. You know, mm. as he goes, he you know, there's the, you know, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. It's like, what the, the it's so funny rereading the Clavel now is like, yeah. I, it really is true. Every single person in this movie is scheming for series. how they're yeah, going yeah. to in the miniseries for yeah. scheming for how they're going to take over the world yeah you know yabushige he wants to be shogun too you know like right Black, yeah right. blackthorn isn't just you know and, and we'll see we'll see little hints of it but yeah. in the book it's it's like he's going how do i take the black ship and create a navy that's going to take over this and become the you know and become duke blackthorn of like yeah. he's, <laughs> even when he's in prison he's trying to figure out how he's gonna do all those things yeah and so this idea of the manipulation, this idea of the strategy, the tactics, all of this stuff. And what I think what's brilliant about Toronaga is he knows how to use his enemies. Yes. He knows how to manipulate them into doing the thing that he needs them to do for his own self-interest. You know? Yeah, yeah. All right, and as we head to Ajiro, well, Ajiro, I hope I'm, I don't know I'm, if I'm saying it right, so I apologize to any of our uh, Japanese uh, uh, people who watch the show who, who would know how to pronounce that. Um, they go into this attack. Uh, they're attacked on the road there, right as uh, right after Blackthorn, Blackthorn asks Mariko if if he has a if Toronaga has a plan for if they get caught and. Mariko kind of takes a hesitation before she answers and says, I'm sure my Lord has a plan. So even maybe she's got some questions here and we'll certainly we'll see Yabushige later say to Toronaga, I wish you'd tell me your plans for a while. Let me know. Your stuff. <laughs> so yeah, just let me know. Let a, let a brother know. Let a brother know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Blackthorn is a bit concerned about all of this. And before he can get too deep into worrying about what might happen if they get caught, they essentially are caught because Lord Kiyama's men show up here and start raining down fire-laced uh, arrows onto them, uh, and uh, we see them fighting them off. We see all of this uh, battle going on here with Mariko and Blackthorn jumping into the fray themselves to help to help push back Ishido's men, and then the ambush becomes a melee where it looks like everybody is fighting everybody here because it's nearly pitch black and all of this. We even have one of Kiyama's men asks, "Are they fighting each other?" And just to throw in a little, a couple little. Uh, uh, um, uh, facts about this. The stunt coordinator on the companion podcast, Lauro David Chartrand Del Valle, pointed out that they wanted the action on the show to feel historically accurate. So there's no flourish, there's no kicks, right. no flips, no flashy moves. And the thing that M Mariko is using uh, is um, is one of those uh, long kind of samurai swords that lady samurais use, samurai fighters used back then. So very accurate in terms of the equipment they're using um, here. Uh, it's it's called a naginata, is what it is a pole a type of pole arm with a curved sword at the end, and it was a traditional weapon used by female samurai. But then Yabushige joins in to aid Toronaga here, 
showing his loyalty to him and says, as I said, one of these days, I'd like to know your plan before it happens. Um, and then uh, what we see is Buntaro, who is Mariko's husband, step forward after he'd had a bit of a hard interaction yet again earlier in the episode between Mariko and him when he was telling her that she's going on this trip and there's nothing she can say about it. So, you know, we've been presented B Buntaro as this kind of guy who's a bit of a, a, um, a rough customer, a guy who is domineering his, his wife. And we've seen Mariko have all these talents that seem to not be appreciated by Buntaro. But Buntaro has a couple of really great moments in this episode, but he's the one that tells them, you guys head to the harbor. We will hold off the armies. Uh, and they all take off here uh, towards the harbor. So what do you think of this fight sequence, Steve, and the way this all went down and the, the shifting of um, who's in charge, who's on top, and all the stuff that's going down here with the fights and the, and the battles, and then Yabushige coming forward here to kind of uh, help Tornai and Tornaga revealing that he's there um, and uh, for everybody to see, even to his son, who didn't know that he had made the switch with Lady Kiri. What do you think of this? So, first of all, the Yabushige moment of sometime, I hope you tell me your plans in advance. That's great. That's just a great moment. And you and that's the yeah. kind of moment in a movie where you go or in a miniseries where you go, yes, I'm in. I'm into this relationship. Yeah. I'm signed up. I love Mariko picking up the Naginata. That's just, I mean, as you said, it's traditional from the time. I And, and it's very much in the book because... One of the mm. things the book is about and that Shogun is about is that there are these different societies, yeah. both of whom call each other barbarians, both of whom are disgusted by each other's Great certain point. traits of the other side, right. and both of whom, particularly Blackthorn and Mariko and Tornaga, learn all the values and the amazing things about the other side. I mean, this is where my fascination with Japan started. And yeah. for Blackthorn to turn around and see this tiny woman pick up this big huge weapon and clearly know how to use it yeah and without hesitating to protect her liege lord that's a really cool thing yeah um yeah. i think and i think too you've been you know buntaro it, it, it's it's always cool when a film can give you the information that takes pages and pages and pages in the book you described him perfectly mm. he's not a fun guy you know, there's obviously <laughs> tension between him and Mariko, yeah. which comes, by the way, because Mariko's father assassinated his liege lord, which is oh. which is Garota, which is the dictator before the Taiko. Right. Um, right. Which in which in reality, I think is Nobunaga. And uh, and so she wanted to kill herself. She's totally shamed and she's been forced to stay alive. And it's screwed up things for Buntaro. It's screwed up all sorts of stuff. And so because killing your liege and assassinating your liege lord, that's the worst thing you could do right. in this samurai culture. And I, but but they also do with Buntaro. And I think they did it great is he's a badass. Yeah. He, yeah, you want him when you're in the middle of a battle. You want him on your side because he's unquestionably brave. He's not going to quit. He's tough. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they really do show that really well. And I agree. I'm very happy that we're not doing flips. We're not flying around on wires. We're not doing, they're, they're doing yeah. very traditional Japanese martial arts of the era. And I, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, and as we move on here, Tornaga's faction arrives at the harbor. Blackthorn recognizes the friendly crew on the docks, of course, because that's the uh, crew that he right. helped out earlier in the series here in those first two episodes. Um, and then we get a shot of seeing all what they're confronted by with all right. these people, all these uh, forces moving there amongst the alleyways heading towards the harbor here. And then as they get on the ships and they start rowing out there, Buntaro arrives at the dock. He survived this whole uh, battle here to come out to the harbor and uh, both Bla and Blackthorn wants to go back. Yeah, and even right. Lady Mariko a little bit, you see, she doesn't say it, but you can see it in her eyes that she wants to go back. And they don't end up going back. Yeah, Bushige says it's not possible. Uh, and Buntaro understands that after he fights off like eight dudes on the dock yeah. there. Looks at Toronaga. And I'm going to tell you right now, I know he's been presented as a bit of a jerk throughout these first two and a half episodes, I would say. I got emotional. It just, yeah. uh, and I think this is why I love the samurai culture to be honest. And I'm not trying to gloss over some of the historical, historical aspects. I'm not trying to ignore some of the nefarious stuff that they, the samurai did. If you do the history of samurai, you know, there are ways that they were used or things that they did that were pretty terrible. But like in this moment, it's that sense of honor and nobility, yeah. that thing that we, we seem to be missing nowadays in our world. Buntaro understands he must sacrifice himself and understands he can't go with them, understands that he has a responsibility to his Lord. And he, you know, stands up strong, yells out to respect and Toronaga 
stands up and yells out his actual name, not oh. the not the Buntaro nickname they've used for him, and gives him the respect with the bow. And even Mariko, he has an exchange of looks with Mariko without saying a word that shows that you know he has love and respect for her, even if he was terrible at showing it. And even she is conflicted with how she's feeling about it because as we've seen how he treats her, and he runs off into these guys, battles them into an alley. And I haven't read the I haven't read the book, so I don't know. I imagine this is the end of Buntaro. Um, and if it isn't, I'm, I look forward to him coming back here. But uh, we see that happen uh, b- between them there. And um, well, we see that uh, Kiyama's men have blockaded the harbor uh, and Toronaga's galley won't be able to, to break through. Uh, and um, we see now that uh, uh, Blackthorn tells them to go along to the other ship and move the ship closer to the black ship uh, where the Portuguese captain is at, who earlier in the show had had this back and forth with the Portuguese priests about like, look, my ship is sailing. I don't care what you guys do. I have my faith to the crown. I, and I think this is Ferreira. He's going to go with his ship. Um, but now Blackthorn goes over there and then we have this deal between Toronaga and and the captain of that ship, and they exchange deals. We hear that he's going to put a church, that Tornaga's going to put a Catholic church in Edo. He's going to give him, like, I think 10,000 silver coins to invest in the silk trade, and he'll get to keep half. And the last part of the deal, though, is that um, Blackthorn must stay behind, essentially surrendering him to Kiyama and all these other lords who want him dead, including possibly Ishido. Uh, And the deal is made here, Steve. But then we get this insane action sequence where Rodriguez and Blackthorn are essentially competing as they row out their ships, Blackthorn using the black ship as a bit of a, a barrier or a force field to get through Kiyama's men here and comes out the other side. Rodriguez does not crash him into the side of the rocks as he possibly could have done, and he escaped, and they all escape out of this thing, regardless of the deals that were made. So what are your thoughts on this whole sequence here with Puntaro and then them all negotiating their way out of the harbor, both by force and by negotiation? Let me ask you this first. Yeah. Were, you, were you having fun watching this sequence? Oh, 100%. From yeah. beginning to end, although I thought uh, Toronaga gave up too much, I enjoyed what it all led to, uh, and it got me on board. It's very modern, especially with the back and forth between Blackthorn and Rodriguez. The, the, so I, I, I really liked it. I thought it was great. Yeah. I'll give you a couple of couple of things that are different from the book that I think are oh, interesting. Yeah. Is so Buntaro, and it's so interesting because the way they handle it works great. Obviously, it moved you. It was great. He yeah. gets to that dock. He's got a little bit of time. He realizes he can't make it out to the ship. He sees all the soldiers, and in the book, he kneels down to commit seppuku. He's that's what I thought he was going to do. Yeah, that's what happens in the book. And oh. Blackthorn is freaking out. He's like, and he doesn't right. like Buntaro, but he's like, no, he can't. He j- j- swim or something, do something. Right. He can't let him die. And Mariko explains that the worst thing for a samurai is to get captured because there will be torture, there will be dishonor. There's, it's much better for him to kill himself. And it's finally Toronaga that orders him not to commit seppuku. Oh. And to try to escape. Um, and so, so that's just a, di- it's just different, you know, and what yeah. happens in the, in the movie is, is great. Um, the, 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 what happens with Rodriguez and Blackthorn on the ship is something I love. And I was sad that they didn't do, which is that Rodriguez goes, Hey, why don't you come on the black ship? And Blackthorn goes, no. And Rodriguez goes, I have booze. I have roasted meats. I have bread and <laughs> butter. I have all that. Blackthorn goes, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so he goes on the ship gets immediately drunk and throwing up because he just hasn't had anything like this in a long yeah. time and mariko is there and gets and the the sailors don't know that she speaks portuguese and they say all sorts of horrible things Oof. about calls the monkeys and they talk to her because they think maybe she's a prostitute and Oof. you know really terrible but yeah. what's good about that scene is it does is that Rodriguez then talks to her and says, look, don't you call us barbarians? Don't you think that we mm-hmm. smell? Don't you? And it ends up that Rodriguez is actually married to a Japanese woman oh. whose wife speaks Japanese pretty well. And Mariko, it's the first moment that Mariko goes, oh, there's different perspectives here. Yeah. But then the key thing is that we have drunk Blackthorn and Rodriguez's spies over here that Toronaga has just sold Blackthorn out. Yeah. And so he gets mad at drunk Blackthorn and throws him overboard. <laughs> And to in order in order to save his life, and then they've kind of worked out this little bit of a deal of yeah. how they're going to both get out of the harbor and watching them play out, pushing each other just far enough. Mm. And it's and it's just a perfect example of we're both great pilots. 
we both totally like you're the you're the best pilot I've ever seen. I'm the best pilot you've ever seen. And they are yeah. fucking with each other and swearing at each other. And it's great. And and what they do in, in the show totally, totally works great. It just doesn't have some of those extra details that I like. Yeah. But I but and, and but again, I go slowly but surely Toronaga and Mariko and Yabushimi go. Oh, this Blackthorn guy. Yeah, he's special. Like yeah. he's there because multiple times now from the uh when they're in the palanquin and he sees tornaga to yeah. to when he's um oh and i have to say what well, it's one other quick thing that's in the book mm -hmm. so in the book they see all the fireboats and the 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 samurai that are waiting that are blocking the harbor and tornaga says to mariko ask blackthorn ask anjin san what we should do how, what's going to get us out and anjin san yeah. just says cannon and he says we'll ask him how we're supposed to do that and blackthorn basically goes no and then, and then Toronaga looks over and sees the black ship and he goes, oh, and turns back and as Mariko asks, why didn't you just tell us we should go to the black ship? And Blackthorn says, well, I think he should use his own head some of the time. <laughs> and Mariko goes, I can't tell him that. And, and Toronaga is like, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? And finally, she translates it and Toronaga just cracks up. <laughs> and it's just one piece of the building of this friend of this relationship that's happening. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like the way this was shot. I really enjoyed the direction in this whole sequence and the um, uh, the back and forths and how this all played out. And even seeing the size of the ship as it yeah. crushes one of these smaller ships, like you really are these one of these sailboats in essence or whatever you want, dinghies or whatever. It just kills and shows you the massive power of a ship like this at that time and the speed with which it can absolutely demolish anything in its way. Uh, and I like seeing the ferocity of that. But is the back and forth between Blackthorn and Rodriguez in the book? Because that seemed pretty modern in, in terms of the things they were alluding to, like your lips on my mom's ass or on the devil's ass and these the sexual innuendo with the huge uh, steering rod there. Oh, what was Is that all just added for the show or was that part of the of the book itself too? No, it's much filthier in the book. What? Really? Oh, yeah. They're all oh over each God. other. I'm yeah. shocked here, man. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of thy mother or thy mother was there first or, you, you know, <laughs> a lot of that. And it's really funny. <laughs> well, again, this is why I go. Yeah. I, 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 I'm sold on. Well, I don't remember the actor's name is playing Rodriguez, but I am oh, sold on. Yeah, but yeah. this is also why I go. Picture John Reese davies saying these things. <laughs> you know, they're really fun. <laughs> Fair point, fair point. All right, so we get out of the harbor here uh, and we get to the last scene, which I think is really interesting because during that negotiation scene with the priests, Tornaga has been handed those books that essentially prove that Blackthorn was a pirate and was uh, that was his intention in all of this. And of course, he's been denying it, denying it, and denying it. And now as we see the sunrise, kind of similar to him watching the sunrise at the beginning of the of the episode, Tornaga himself there, we see that they are on the ship and they're having these conversations uh, and he's um, and he's talking about this. Oh, well, you know, we're, we're going to he wants to Mariko to translate all of this stuff. And they're having the conversation about him being a pirate. And that's cr it's a crime that's punishable by death. Um, but Tornaga essentially when he confronts him with it, it looks like he's going to carry out some kind of sentence here. But then he says, but these uh, logs are probably going to take a long time to translate. So in the meantime, I am going to ask you to train uh, or teach a regiment and Yoboshige and my son to teach them your tax tactics, the barbarians tactics here to counter this stuff so that when they're attacked, they're going to be able to make moves just like he just did in the harbor and counteract the instincts here and throw them off. So Blackthorn agrees to it, and uh, Tornaga calls him Hatamoto uh, with orders to take those weapons uh, he saved and train a regiment for foreign tactics. Uh, and for those who don't know, Hatamoto uh, were elite samurai who served directly under the shogun or daimyo, occupying esteemed positions in the military structure. It underscore uh, the term's meaning underscores its role as those entrusted with guarding the Lord's standard on the battlefield. And then we have this really interesting sequence well first we have the conversation i should mention this but between blackthorn and Mariko, that's very tender and she's asking about his family because they had they had talked about that earlier on the walk about his daughter about his son and he essentially admits that uh, brandy you're a fine girl but <laughs> my love is the sea he's essentially saying that he hasn't seen his daughter <laughs> before his daughter was born but he's called to the sea. He's just one of these guys that's called to the sea. And he uh, also expresses sympathy towards Mariko very, very genuinely, very uh, sweet moment between them. And Mariko takes that in 
because you sense that her attraction to him is starting to grow a little bit. Yeah. And so I like that they don't overplay it. It's just kind of sitting there. And then Toronaga shows up. But the final sequence is um, essentially Toronaga, uh, who is a very proud lord and, of course, in charge of his people. He's not going to jump headfirst into anything. He has uh, Blackthorn teach him how to dive by diving in multiple times into the water until Toronaga has fully grasped what it is then, because he likes to run once he understands he doesn't need to walk, he says, I'm going to dive in and then race you to the shore. And that's essentially how uh, the show ends with uh, Mariko kind of smiling as she watches this happen. So, Steve, your thoughts on these on these final scenes here on the uh, boat, um, on the ship, rather, uh, as we head towards the end of this episode? So, I have many, many thoughts. The first okay. thing that I like is that in that scene that you described where they have the rudders, they have, you know, the information that's going to uh, expose yes. Blackthorn. Yeah, it's exactly the Yabushimi scene, which is I have something which could get you killed. Yes, but I am choosing not to use that, and I'm going in the exact opposite direction. Mm. Um, and uh, and and so I, I, a, I really like that, and I think you really get the size of Hatamoto, what that means by yeah. Mariko's uh, reaction to it. Yeah. That, so I, I think that's really, really cool. I think the scene with Mariko is beautiful where yeah. they talk about the family and all this stuff. And you see, you get that connection. And, I, and that's why I think the, the show was so smart to show her disliking him and not trusting him when we meet right. him. That's much more than what's happening in the book. Right. And and I think, you know, that's classic romantic structure. You know, that's, cl- yeah. you know, is that you start off disliking each other and then you come to depend upon each other and respect each other. And And, and I think that scene really, really works well. It's probably the most human and tender moment that we've had in the entire show so far is Ooh. just the two because there's so much scheming and violence yeah, and stuff yeah. going on and politics yeah. and all this other stuff that just having these two humans who obviously are feeling pain but also have a sense of duty and that they're sharing yeah. about you know that intimate part of themselves i think is really really cool the diving scene i think they did a great it's it's different from the book but <laughs> okay. i loved it i loved it i'll tell you what happens in the book which is that in the book um the he, he dives and Tornado goes, well, I want to learn how to do that. And he goes, okay, well, it's easiest if you go down to the lower level and we do a little dive from like, and Tornado's like, I'm not going to do that. And so he does like an hour plus of belly flops. Oh, and all the other samurai are all doing belly flops over and over. And, Tor- and Blackthorn's oh. going, no, it's really, and finally gets Mariko to go down and do a little tiny dive right. from somewhere lower. And then finally, but, but you know, he also witnesses everybody's, discipline that over and over and over again they're going to take the pain necessary to do this thing oh wow and one other element of the book is that in the book they're all naked and you know obviously this is something where you know this is one of the big elements of the story and maybe this is something where we can say like the white european perspective found all of this a little titillating but the different cultural ways of looking at nudity and sexuality is a big theme in the book and so we got naked blackthorn looking at naked mariko (laughs) <laughs> and all of the and and telling him basically saying be wow. cool this is not a big deal you know like you you're right. in this other culture and that's one of the blackthorn's big struggles is like okay this is just a different culture you're mm-hmm. there now you have to be you have to be calm you have to be responsible you have to be you have to understand this he's like be cool be cool but then there's some moments where he has to jump in the water <laughs> <laughs> get a nice cold water uh so that that is definitely definitely an element that is much stronger in the book and it's probably one of those elements that i looked at as i got older and went uh maybe this is really about being just titillating you know yeah and and maybe that's what maybe they kind of address that in a in an interesting way throughout this episode too because remember and i didn't mention this scene but we're having the doctor kind of stitch him up at the beginning um when the lady mariko's husband comes in and tells him they're going places but he is like upset about what's happening here calls the guy a warlock uh, and then the guy suggests that he's too tense. He needs to sleep with a woman. There's, of course, Mariko there. So we're starting the process of this idea of them possibly getting together down the road here. But he is almost offended by it, uh, Blackthorn is. And he's and she has to explain to him, we think this is a good thing because it helps your health. And then later on in the episode, when, the, when they revisit this conversation, she says the same thing, p- pillowing with somebody and mentions how it's like clouds in the rain and all of that. So... This is an interesting element of it, uh, um, coursing throughout this episode. They're kind of possible affection growing for each other as they speak about something like this. So clearly, at least in a way, this episode is addressing that kind of thing by making it very plain when they talk about making love, which is makes sense because it's not from the puritanical Catholic point of view where we're taught 
through religion, how sex should only be this. It's very much seen from a, a more of the Eastern point of view, which is it's all part of uh, a human's experience. It's all part of connective uh, things going on here. So I, I found that to be interesting. And maybe that's how they addressed it. But I don't know if that's in the book. So it, it is all in the book. Oh. One, one thing, by the way, James Cavell, between China and Java and Japan and oh. Iran and the other countries that he goes in, he has more words for sex, orgasms, and bodily parts than you could possibly <laughs> imagine. I found them all very amusing. Yeah. Definitely all in the book. Keep in mind, and, I, and it happens in the miniseries too, she doesn't just offer him a woman. She offers him a, a man or a yeah, boy. Right. If he wants that. Yeah, right. If that if he's like, if that's what you're into. And in the book, that is a huge freak out. I mean, like, you know, you know he's right. like, what do you think? I'm a goddamn sodomite, I think is what he says. And he yeah. just totally loses it. And all of Mariko and the maids are all bowing and apologizing and going like, what's up with this guy? Why is he so angry? Who cares if someone wants a boy or, or a woman? It's just sex. You know, it's just why, why would we care? And I think those elements, you know, it, it, it's so funny because, you know, I came from Star Trek, which yeah. is like the enemy is just someone you don't understand, that these are cultural differences, but they're, once you get to know them, you'll understand them. And that's really what Shogun is. Yeah. I mean, Shogun is really about, and, and I think for me, formatively, even though, you know, some of the aspects of it, I, I, I like less as a grown up, but going like, oh, we don't have to treat sex as this big deal. We don't have to be ashamed of our bodies. This is just all natural stuff those are great things for me to learn about at that time you yeah. know yeah, yeah yeah agreed well let's uh wrap up our conversation here steve we've hit all the big events that happen in the series in the show this particular episode but i do want to come back to this thing that i mentioned earlier where um yabushige is talking um to his son and his son is like how could you uh why would you want me why would you keep yabushige around right uh, i'm sorry toronaga is talking to his son right why would you keep yabushige around this makes no sense why would you do this kind of thing and um Toronaga has to school him and says, you are playing a game of friends and enemies when you only have yourself in this life. And that's kind of been the theme of this particular episode. So that kind of struck me, to be honest with you, at a time in my life when I'm trying to put things together and move things around and you start to question people's motives and people's intentions on things. It's an interesting line to hit you because we do, from a historical aspect, know that the character that Toronaga is based on is a person who was very wise and, and wise and led Japan to a time of peace for many, many years, yet he's saying you're playing a game of friends and enemies when you only have yourself in this life. But I guess when you're at that level of po politics and political machinations, certainly we're seeing it playing it now in our election season, people are going to say and do certain things that they wouldn't normally say or do behind closed doors, but they're doing them in the public eye in order to keep certain things in motion. What did you think about the line here and that kind of being a prevalent thing throughout this entire episode. Uh, it syncs up so much with me in the way I think. Maybe not in the everyone's your enemy. I don't think that at all. Right. That's right. not what I think. But I do think is that to me, and you've heard me say this many times, is yeah. I think a lot about eyes on the prize. What am I trying to do? It right. doesn't matter who Kab Kab Yabushimi is. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can't trust Yabushimi. He, I can use him to get to where I want to go. And I'm not saying that therefore we should use people. That's not my point either. My point right. is, what are we trying to do? Like so much, and you know, you bring up our political world today and I'm not yeah. going into the politics. No, but no, the way that our political world works today is those people are evil and they're the enemy and therefore must be destroyed. And therefore all of my people must be good. Yeah, And that is not reality. That just isn't reality. And none of that has to do with how do we make our country better? You right. know? Right. Like you, you, we're playing a game of, of friends and enemies when we actually have our own goals, when we actually like are trying to, I'm not, I don't need to destroy my enemy. I yeah. need to get the things that I need to get. Yeah. Like, it, you know, it's like, there's that line, you know, I know you love Ken Burns civil war yeah. um, uh, documentary as much as I do. And there's a line of Lincoln. It's like, if I could save the union and keep slavery, I would do that. And if mm -hmm. to save the union, I had to destroy slavery. I would do that. My yeah. goal is to save the union. And it's like, this is this is the thing that I think about. It's like, if he could make a deal with it, he hates Ishido, but if he right. could make a deal with Ishido and become Shogun and have the country work well and yeah. give Ishido, and Ishido gets a lot of money, Tornaga would totally do that because yeah. that's what he wants. He's not trying, you know, it's the point isn't who's my enemy. The point is what is my goal, you right. know? And we see it play out in the final scene. And I, I should mention this, the final scene of the, of the show or one of the final scenes of the episode that I didn't touch on is, uh, when he comes in and resigns from the council after yep. Ishido essentially said, well, we're going to 
vote on it and he's going to be gone and they have a little battle him uh ishido and um uh oh god what's the lord there who sent the people against him uh, who attacked in the forest they have a back and forth about this whole thing and so you see that there's a little bit more going on here between them that might be leading to a bit of division so i'm very curious to see how that's going to play itself out here but then his right hand man shows up and essentially says he's resigned from the council uh, and they go, well, it doesn't, she just said, it doesn't matter. We're going to vote him out four to one, four to nothing. And uh, Kamashiga says, uh, well, you can't because yeah. the rule is five must vote. There must be five votes either way. And yeah. you, have, you don't have five people anymore. So you see the close up on Ishido is so great to end the episode and the look on his face of like, God, mother. So I love that as an ending because he's outsmarted them yet again. So at some point, is Ishido going to lose all pretense of manners uh, and civility and go after him full bore? Or is he going to start to see that maybe he's got to come to uh, Totonaga's side? I'm going to be very curious to see as we go through these next few episodes. What do you think of that scene there and how they played out? And is that the way it is in the book? Uh, I, It is not exactly where it is in the book, but it is definitely, yeah, you need four, you need five votes. And, and there's more in the book about who would this fifth person be? How do you get a fifth right. person? Right. You know, um, the, the one other thing that I, I wanted to bring up just because I, I, I think the final moment of the episode yeah. is fantastic, which is we set up this diving thing. Yes. And, they're, and that they're going to race. I love, which is also in the book that Mariko says, do not let him win. Oh, Another right. thing, though, that right. I thought about yeah. is, yes, Blackthorn is now going to try his hardest and not let Toranaga win. But what did Toranaga do for maybe the last hour is make Blackthorn repeatedly dive into the water over right. and over and over again. Right. Blackthorn is tired at this point. And yeah. it's a classic Toranaga strategy is that I said, no, you have to play fair with me. Don't let me win. But I tired you out in front of time to give myself a tiny little advantage. I love that. I love that. And then, but then there's this moment. They're both yeah. standing on the, you know, the gunnel of the ship. They're both looking at each other. We're about to dive in. And I forget the exact line, but Tornaga kind of looks over and goes, let us begin or something like that. Right. And there is a sense, and this is, this is what film can do that books can't. That moment of them diving into the water together, both taking a leap of faith after Tornaga says, let us begin, is saying, we are together now. Yeah. But yeah. We, you and I are going to do something great. That's what that moment feels like as they dive into the water. Well, there's a symbolism of that. Both of them racing to the shore. In, in yeah. essence, racing to the end of this thing and arriving together safely, right? That's kind of a goal here where they are now uh, together united to try to make this happen to help Japan reach the shore because right now it's out to sea a little bit. So there's yep. symbolism in that moment as well. And I should correct myself, uh, Hiromatsu is who brings in the scroll there to uh, have uh, right. uh, Tulanaga resign from the council. I apologize to anybody who's upset about me saying the wrong character name because sometimes you guys you guys get upset. So I just want to clarify that. <laughs> All right. Any final words here, Steve, as we wrap up this review? No, I'm having a ball, though. I I, I really feel like they, they're, they're killing it. I'm kind of curious to hear. I'm really glad. That's why I keep checking in with you that you who haven't read the book. Yeah. Are, are are still with it and enjoying it as much as I do, and it makes me very happy that you are. A hundred percent, and because they're they're doing. A, a, and I should give a shout out to the writer Shannon Goss, who adapted this particular uh, uh, episode. Wrote this episode, and it was directed by Charlotte Brandstrom. Uh, I, I thought they absolutely nailed again, just like the first two episodes, the right mix of the political intrigue and the stakes with the very real organic humor that can happen in situations like this that keep you entertained, along with the more serious exchanges that are going on and some great action sequences and fight sequences that I thought worked really well. And Charlotte Brinstrom definitely deserves a lot of credit for directing this episode. I mean, the shot from above of seeing them all running through the alley oh, is so a cool. smart way to show what the odds are, right? And then in so much of her other shots throughout the show, I thought were fantastic, especially the action sequence between the two of the ships going at each other, trying to skirt around oh, the rocks. It's really, really well done. Yeah, very, very good direction. Yeah. And right it just, well. Something just occurred to me, and it's just my secret hope, which is that sh I was, just suddenly went, well, you know, this is great. I'm loving it. Shogun is not my favorite James Clavell book. No. And I suddenly went, ooh, if this is a success, can you do Taipan next? Taipan <laughs> is my favorite James Clavell book. Oh, that's a good point. I, I would love to see that, because there's yeah. that horrible movie with what's-his-name, whose name I don't remember. Um... Uh, mm. totally draw a blank, and the movie sucks. It's not a it's not a good movie. There's a Noble House movie, which I think is Pierce Brosnan in it, and it's think, or it yeah. might have been a miniseries. And oh, it's Brian not good. Brown is the lead in Taipan. Brian yeah. Brown, yes, 
Yeah. So Taipan is a great book and would and and this treatment would be amazing if they could pull it off. And then they well, could do Noble House and then I'll be happy. Yeah, they go through the the Cl the yeah. Clavelliverse, I guess you would say. Exactly yeah. the Clavelliverse. <laughs> they are all connect they're all connected. That's true. Oh yeah, right, exactly. That I do know about the book, so it could be yeah. interesting. Uh, all right, but well, there you go. That's our spoiler review for episode three here of uh, Shogun. Uh, tomorrow is tomorrow. Uh, we appreciate you all listening to us or hearing us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation here. Steve, a brother, much love to you. Thanks so much for joining. I'm so happy we're do going down this journey together. So much of our interests coming together in one show, and it's a blast to have you giving us the book side of things as well as your thoughts on what's going on in the series here. Where can people find you and everything you got going on? Uh, SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And of course we're continuing the epic. The, this will be our longest season of a director ever. Yeah. We are in our season of Scorsese. We just finished Goodfellas. Part one of Raging Bull is up now. Part two of Raging Bull. I will go back to editing as soon as I get off of this <laughs> recording. And then right after that, we're going to roll into the last temptation of Christ. So yeah. that is some exciting stuff happening on the Cinephiles. Absolutely. If you guys don't know about the Cinephiles, it's a show that Steve and I co-host. We've been co-hosting as a podcast for the last eight years. This show talking about one great film every week, breaking it down sometimes over multiple parts. And as he mentioned, we are in the season of Scorsese right now. So come and take a chance. We've probably covered a film that you love, multiple films that you love over these last eight years. So come and take a chance and hang out with us and listen to us. If you enjoy our exchanges here on this review. All right, take care of yourselves. Be well, follow me at the Roka says, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell button, leave a comment, share it on social media and come back and join us next week for another brand new spoiler review episode here of Shogun on the outlaw nation. Peace until then. Mm -hmm.